Greetings, listeners. You're tuned in to episode 48 of This Week with David Rovix. As some of you may have noticed, there was no episode last week. In the midst of everything involved with flying with my family from Portland to Denmark, recovering from jet lag, setting up the cafe we're running for the summer, driving across Denmark for a gig, and writing two songs, I never had time to write the weekly column or record the podcast. If you happen to be in Denmark this summer, drop by for an espresso drink at Café Hellebeck and look at the waves lapping against the shore with me. I'm hosting a song swap in the café every Thursday evening, and later this month I'll be opening the nearby Himmelstorm Festival, along with several other gigs in Denmark and Sweden. And if you're in the UK or elsewhere in Europe, I'd love to hear from anyone who might be inclined to organize a gig for me in the fall, as well as in parts of the US as well. Okay, here's this week's podcast. Concentration camps in the United States are nothing new. As has been widely reported, one of the many new austere prison camps for dividing up and indefinitely detaining families for the crime of being refugees that has recently opened up is one in Oklahoma that was previously used for the same purposes during the Second World War to imprison Japanese-American families and to kidnap and abuse Native American children. Concentration camps in America go back to the days when white people could supplement their farming income by being paid for each Indian scalp they turned into the colonial authorities. They go back to the reservations and the slave plantations, and they continue to this day with mass incarceration, mass torture through solitary confinement, and by many other means. What's different now, as opposed to how it has been in anyone's living memory up till the present? is the authorities are bragging about their concentration camps, very openly expanding them, openly flouting court judgment after court judgment, telling them to return the children to their parents, and the government departments ignoring the courts and committing crimes against humanity that flagrantly violate U.S. and international law are being led by what is known as acting heads. These are mostly people that have not even been vetted by any congressional procedures, and just appointed as blatantly political appointments with no sign that the administration is ever going to submit to the normal appointment process that involves a bit of congressional oversight. What's different now is there are no more dog whistles. There are no more fig leaves. There's just completely open, naked racism, xenophobia, sexism, and then plans for a new world war, beginning with an impossibly draconian embargo on global trade with Iran that is designed to provoke some kind of desperate response from an increasingly cornered political leadership of an increasingly hungry, angry nation full of young people whose dreams are currently being crushed by Uncle Sam. And you can hear how the corporate media suddenly then talks of the U.S. government when it comes to the potential war with Iran. It's no longer the crazy, arrogant Trump but now it's the State Department, as if said department weren't actually being led by a totally deranged ideologue bent on nuclear war. So they increasingly put this veneer of respectability on this administration that they have for years now been describing in overwhelmingly negative terms. The corporate media doesn't use the word, but much of the population increasingly realizes, either with glee or with horror, that they are living in a nascent sort of fascist country, where ultimately the future is very unknown and, for many, far more terrifying than the present. Both in person, before I left the U.S. to spend the summer in Denmark, and of course online, I encounter more and more people saying things like, my country is kidnapping, imprisoning, and torturing refugee children. We have concentration camps. I don't know what to do. Of course, people may go protest and come home, and they, we all know, this isn't going to change anything. To one degree or another, most people realize that challenging what is becoming an entrenched fascist sort of regime will require far more than some protest rallies. People know you have to shut down the country, stop business as usual, like in other recent examples on planet Earth where popular movements have caused governments to fall. But one person can't just start being a movement. So we wait for that massive militant movement to form that we can join, and we wait and we wait. We all had that conversation when we were kids about how if we could go back in time and shoot Hitler, even though we'd be sacrificing our lives in the process, we'd do it. 
but we probably wouldn't, and we don't. The overwhelming majority of humanity, quite sensibly, according to the historical record, don't stick their necks out like that unless they think there's at least some remote chance of coming out the other end with their heads intact, along with a victorious social movement and an end to the fascist dictator they're trying to get rid of in the first place. Social movements are based on optimism, and this isn't an optimistic moment in America. So this is what it's like. So this is what it's like to live in such a place where kids with book bags and braces take the bus to school, learn the golden rule. So this is what it's like to live in such a nation where people stay within their stations, where the businessmen wear ties, they have a burger, coke, and fries. So this is what it's like to live in the country where kids go to the beach to party Mowing lawns for summer wages While other kids get put in cages So this is what it's like When you learn to go ahead Put your kids to bed Try not to think as you turn out the lamp About the ones in our detention camps So this is what it's like With the rule of law suspended Society upended You don't know what to do They're taking away your neighbors But they're not citizens like you So this is what it's like This has been episode 48 of This Week with David Brovix. The song This Is What It's Like is one I just wrote, and you can find it in the Broadsides playlist on my YouTube channel and my SoundCloud page. You can also find this podcast and all the other 47 episodes of it on those platforms, as well as on Spotify, Google Play, and all the other usual places if you search for This Week with David Rovix, or via the David Rovix mobile app, or at davidrovix.com slash this week, where you can also read about various financial and non-financial ways you can support my podcasting efforts. Hope to see you in podcast land next week or else I'll have to change the name of my podcast. <laughs>